I'm Dr. Yadira Martinez. I'm the director of the outpatient cardiology clinic at Nicholas Children's Hospital. Today we are going to talk about syncope in children and adolescents. Let's just start by defining what syncope is. It's an abrupt transient loss of consciousness from a decrease in the cerebral blood flow, which is most often the result of an abrupt drop of the systemic blood pressure. The inadequate serial flow is of relatively brief duration, rarely more than a minute or two. Longer periods of real or apparent loss of consciousness suggest that the event is not syncope or is not syncope alone. The lifetime incidence of syncopal events are 3 to 37 percent. This include young patients. From six months to six years of age, 5% can present with breath holding spells. From 18 years to 25 years of age, 15 to 22% have incidence of syncope. The prevalence of syncope in adults is 3% of the emergency room visits in the United States and 1 to 6% of hospital admissions in the United States. So the etiology of syncope in patients from 0 to 21 years of age varies. The most common one is the reflexive type, cardiac, hypovolemic, and psychologic. We're going to go over all these etiologies. Reflexive one peaks in the teenage years, usually is not exertional, and the patients are normally oriented after the event. Cardiac syncope is 10% of the cases, Exertional syncope, suspect from physical examination, electrocardiogram, and echocardiogram. And the hypovolemic may be part of the postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Psychologic, they're frequent events. The tilt study often is provocative and is usually witnessed. non syncopal causes of transient loss of consciousness. This is important for your differential diagnosis. You have to consider seizure disorders traumatic brain injury like concussion, intoxication, metabolic disturbances, especially in patients with diabetes, insulin dependent, and also conversion disorders. Let's start with the cardiac etiologies of syncope. I have divided in five categories according to the pathophysiology. Inflow obstruction, outflow obstruction, coronary insufficiency, tachycardias or tachyarrhythmias, and bradycardia. Let's start with the inflow obstruction. Basically, there is inadequate ventricular filling. In this category, we have pericardial effusion, constrictive pericarditis, cardiac tumor, mitral or tricuspid valve stenosis, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. In the case of pericardial effusion, there's usually a history of autoimmune disorders like lupus or JRA, or the patient has had a recent viral infection and probably has developed pericarditis. Constricted pericarditis, there's usually a history of radiation to the chest or history of tuberculosis. Cardiac tumors can present with the heart murmur or sometimes not have any symptoms, only presents with syncope. Mitral or tricuspid valve stenosis is a congenital heart disease. Usually there is a heart murmur and there's a history of the patient having the congenital heart disease. And restricted cardiomyopathy is sometimes presenting with a loud second heart sound. Outflow obstruction. Aortic and subaortic valve stenosis, pulmonary of subpulmonary valve stenosis. They both are congenital heart disease and they present with a systolic ejection murmur. Pulmonary hypertension, patient may or may not have a history of congenital heart disease. Pulmonary hypertension can be also idiopathic. The patient can present with fatigue or dyspnea with exertion and syncope with exertion. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can present with a heart murmur that it gets worse with exertion. There's left ventricular outflow tract obstruction during exercise that can lead to syncope 
this may be an inherited condition and can also present with sudden cardiac death. Coronary abnormalities. In the pediatric population, the coronary abnormalities are either congenital or acquired secondary to vasculitis. Coronary artery stenosis is typical in patients that had Kawasaki disease or patients that had other type of vasculitis, as I mentioned before, like polyarteritis nodosum. Anomalous origins of the coronary artery, it is congenital. It can present with syncope or chest pain with exertion. Also can present with sudden cardiac death. In this case, the coronary artery is between the aorta and the pulmonary artery and is being compressed during exercise. Most of these cases are when the left coronary artery is the one that is abnormal. Tachycardia or tachyarrhythmias. They cause inadequate left ventricular filling. In this case, the patient will have less cardiac output because the contractility is not being effective. Catecholaminergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that can be exclusive during exercise or induced by stress. This could be familiar. Long QT syndrome, which could be acquired, like in the case of electrolyte imbalance, like hypomagnesemia, like hypokalemia. Um, it can be present in patients that have eating disorders, likely due to electrolyte imbalance. Medications can also produce long QT. However, in this case, it is reversible once the disturbance it is fixed. Also, we have the long QT syndrome, which is inherited, um, which they have variable associations and it can present with sudden cardiac death. It can be induced by exercise, sudden loud noise, emotion, and rest. Um, they have ventricular tachycardia or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. Brugada syndrome also will present with ventricular tachycardias. The patients can have electrocardiogram. Brugada syndrome also can present with ventricular tachycardia and sudden cardiac death. The electrocardiographic abnormalities are pathognomonic. There's usually a pseudo right bottom branch block in B1 and ST segment elevation that goes from B1, B2, and B3. Pre-excitation syndrome, the most commonly known as WBW, there's usually a delta wave. The patients can present with syncope with exertion or sudden cardiac death. And cardiomyopathies, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we discussed about it, can present with arrhythmias as the initial presentation and also arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy which presents with ventricular tachycardia originated from the right ventricle. Bradycardia. This is the opposite of what we discussed before. In this case, there is ineffective contraction. We have sinus node dysfunction, AV block, and pacemaker malfunctioning. Sinus node dysfunction is usually in patients that had prior congenital heart disease surgery like Fontaine or atrial switch, AB block in patients that have Lyme disease, history of neuromuscular disorders or mitochondrial disorders, and pacemaker malfunctioning in those patients that are pacemaker dependent. Fortunately, the most common causes of syncope in the adolescents and children is more benign. Basovagal syncope is the most common cause of syncope in children. It's also known as neurocardiogenic syncope, reflex or situational syncope, and common fainting. It is precipitated by a combination of postural, emotional, and physiological stress. There are reflex precipitants like swallowing, hair grooming, and micturition. The patient describes a program like 
lightheadedness, dizziness, visual changes, decreased acuity, tunnel vision, or double vision. Patient can also have nausea, pallor, and diaphoresis prior to the fainting. The proposed mechanism of vasovagal syncope is basically a blood pooling in the lower extremities or decreasing the systemic venous return. This will decrease the right ventricle and the left ventricle filling, which will increase the sympathetic tone. This is a normal response. Paradoxical parasympathetic stimulation will decrease the heart rate and the blood pressure, causing a cardio inhibitory and vasodepressor response. Breath holding spells is present in children 6 to 24 months of age. It is triggered by an emotional insult, such as pain, anger, or fear. This is the typical toddler that is crying and starts holding their breath. It is followed by a cyanosis and loss of consciousness. This is the cyanotic spell. Body the spell is a loss of consciousness that occurs before the breath holding. It could be brief posturing or tonic-clonic motor activity may occur with either both the cyanotic and the padded spells. Generally, these are benign spells typically stopped by five years of age. Tilt table testing. Sometimes we perform a tilt table test when we are not clear about the etiology of the syncope. However, most of the diagnosis of syncope, it is clinical. The sensitivity of the tilt table testing is 55 to 65% for basovagal syncope, which means if the tilt table test is negative, that doesn't rule out basovagal syncope. However, the specificity is 90%. It may help demystify the clinical phenomenon, and it doesn't have any value to predict drug efficacy. So as I mentioned before, the diagnosis of vasovagal syncope is mainly clinical. Postural tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. There is a symptomatic fall in the blood pressure after standing. It's very common in adolescent girls. There is a 30 beats per minute increase with orthostatic changes. It is recurrent. The patient is dizzy, feel lightheaded, have her vision, feel fatigue, but syncope rarely occur. So the initial evaluation of a patient with syncope is basically a good history, a physical examination, and an electrocardiogram. Based on that, if we know the cause of syncope, is treated according to the etiology. Very important when you're evaluating a patient with syncope, what happened prior to the syncope? Was the patient having dizziness, palpitation, pallor? There were any triggers? Was the patient standing up? Hydration status? What happened during the syncope? There was any convulsion, posturing, loss of bowel, bladder control that may indicate seizures. Other questions are, did it happen during exercise? How long did it last? How was the recovery? How was the patient in the recovery? The patient was taking medications. Is there any comorbid conditions like congenital heart disease, seizure disorder, diabetes type one. So when we get our history, the predictors of benign syncope, no known cardiac disease, history of prolonged standing position or postural changes, presence of a program like nausea, vomiting, feeling warm, which is very typical of vasovagal syncope, presence of a specific triggers like dehydration, pain, 
a distressful stimulus, medical environment, also typical in vasovagal syncope. Situational triggers like cough, laugh, maturation, or defecation. And the red flags will be syncope that occurs during exercise. Trauma secondary to the syncope. History of incontinence. History of congenital or acquired heart disease. History of family with sudden cardiac death. Abnormal physical findings or abnormal electrocardiograms and abnormal vital signs. Therapies to prevent vasovagal syncope. Unfortunately, no therapy has been proven consistently to be effective for recurrent vasovagal syncope. However, it is important to reassure our patients the benign nature of the reflex syncope, but warn about the injury and potential and accident risk. Avoid potential triggers. It is important for the patient to recognize what the potential triggers are. Is it because of prolonged standing, a straining during micturition, or bowel movements, any stressful situations such as blood donation? Also, it is important to identify warning symptoms and whenever feasible to lay supine with the legs elevated when warning symptoms arise. The patient should not get back up until they feel stable. Sometimes the patients feel better and immediately stand up and faint again. So that's why it's very important to remain laying down if possible until all the symptoms are gone. This concludes the presentations. I wanna thank you for joining us in the Physician Chat videos.